started, a friend of mine uh, told me that they were looking for a photographer. And um, I had just graduated with her from um, Pratt Institute with an MFA in photography. I also had an MA in art history, which is, you know, related to my future, but not that when I first started. And um, what's wonderful is on the 16th or the 15th of June, I was told I got hired and I loved Betsy Rogers right away who hired me and love the mission of uh, the Conservancy. But um, then a few hours after I got hired, I was asked if I could work the next day, which was a Saturday, uh, photographing something at Conservatory Garden. And I thought to myself, oh, I have a feeling this is not gonna be just an ordinary job. Uh, ready, I was hired to come on Monday morning and I, I started my employment on Saturday afternoon and um, had such fun. And on so on Monday morning when I reported to work, I already had three hours overtime. So it was the kind of job that was always surprising. That was my job to really to communicate visually to New Yorkers what was going on for people who, like me, were still afraid to go to the park, not really understanding that this miracle was happening in the middle of Midtown Manhattan. And so, um, you know, that was really important uh, to take the pictures. You know, we would go to groups night after night or fundraising events and show our photographs so that people would begin to trust us and trust going to the park. And then they would see the results and then they would join the conservancy. It was like a wonderful, you know, sort of snowballing effect. So um, I watched, the best part was watching people not just trust the conservancy, but respect the park. And in 1989, I, um, Actually, I asked Betsy for a raise and she said, well, we can't give you a raise unless um, unless you become something else. And she said, you definitely deserve it. And at that time, I had already done a lot of research doing um, history research for the Conservancy. I was a trained art historian. So um, we both decided that uh, the park, the Conservancy didn't have a historian and that would be my new title. And the minute it was my new title, I started reading as much as I could and, um, you know, realized there was so much to learn and so much to uh, write about. Well, there are two. And one is the time period before the park was created. You know, I just finished uh, eight years of research doing my book before Central Park. Uh, when I give tours of the park, uh, people would always raise a hand right away and say, what was this before it was a park? And we knew a little bit, but there were huge gaps. And I thought, well, you know, let me see what I could do. Um, I assumed that I would uh, do the book when I was retired. It would give me something to do. And of course, I never retired, but I did the book anyway with the um, blessing of the Conservancy. Uh, and um, so, you know, there was so, there's so much history that I had no idea happened. None of us had any idea. Wars and, you know, people and stories, uh, really fascinating. But then, of course, the part that I lived is the um, restoration and renaissance of Central Park. I, I think of the first four years as the beginning where I was not part of it. But it was so a magic time when the Conservancy was beginning to get donors and beginning to see the fruits of their labor. When I interviewed Betsy Rogers and the Commissioner Gordon Davis in 2005, we, I, I did a 25-year oral history project. And they said, in our wildest imagination, we never thought we would get this far. And so, um, you know, it was an impossible dream that actually came true and being a part of it, a very small part of it, but a part of it nonetheless, um, watching the park get more and more beautiful every single day, safer, cleaner, 
and used and beloved by millions. And, and it has been, you know, the work of my whole life, my whole adult life to watch this magic happen. That when you talk about the pre-park, with all that happened here, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, immigration, slavery, women's rights, African-American community, the Seneca village, um, so much the Dutch, the native people, so much of American history before the park was here. And then when you add all the history that was played out on in Central Park since its inception, as well as the park existing as a fight for open green space is part of American history. And when you put all of that together, I have proposed, and I, I challenge people to argue with me if they care to, that you there is no more single place in all of America that you can experience American history in its most um, widest uh, fashion than here in the 843 acres that make up Central Park. The uh, North End, the ravine and the walk from Central Park West through the pool across basically to the east side in the Harlem Mirror, which is now being restored. Um, the, the Lasker Rink is now becoming the Harlem Mirror Center. And that that walk is magical with you know beautiful waterfalls and gorgeous um, woodland plantings and it, you just can't believe you're on like Midtown Manhattan and a hundred and you know Third Street and Seventh Avenue. It just feels like you're in the most beautiful part of the Adirondacks, which is of course what Olmsted and Vox wanted you to be in, feel like you were in. And so, um, you know, I love that part. And also when I give tours, um, and because I'm an art historian, I'm always looking at the park as a work of art and comparing it to the Hudson River School painters that were America's first school of um, painting. And, you know, I give a tour and we drive all the way up and I'd be talking about views and scenes and vistas and works of art and how they were like living paintings. And what I loved is when we'd get to the ravine with the waterfalls, people would look at me and go, oh yeah, I get it now. Because it looks like a living, you know, stage set, a movie set, a, a, a beautifully composed picture. And so I love that moment when people get it. Uh, the same way I got it when I first saw it. Uh, North End is the best kept secret. Um, people, even New Yorkers, uh, they just don't go up there unless they live there. But when you get to the upper end, most people are shocked to see how varied the landscape is, how beautiful, how um, well kept it is, how safe it feels. And, and so, um, you know, I always encourage people to go up to the North End. And now that the Conservancy is about to do its last, I mean, finish its last major project, the Harlem Mirror Center um, with a skating rink and a swimming pool, but a whole redesign so that you will be able to go from Central Park West across to the Harlem Mirror on the east side and not have to look at the um, back end of a, a fairly uh, inappropriate skating rink and swimming pool anymore. You, the, the water will go right into the Harlem Mirror. And if you don't want to care about the facility itself, you'll be able to just experience the landscape as Olmsted and Vox would have wanted you to do. You know, I was familiar with Olmsted Parks, even though I didn't know that there were Olmsted Parks. And of course, when I moved to New York, I soon learned very quickly about him and about his, particularly because I'm an art historian, both he and Vox considered themselves artists. And I was very interested in them as artists. And what I realized was, particularly with Olmsted, that um, the park and his park making 
really had to do with um, his psychological makeup, as most artists do. I mean, whatever uh, you could say about him in terms of all the great things he did, he he had he was a troubled soul. And all he looked for in his art was a, a healing, a way to uh, give peace to people, to heal people from this chaos, from the city. Um, what I love about all Olmsted landscapes is the element of surprise. I, to this day in Central Park, you can, you know, depending on the weather, depending on the light, depending on the season of the year, depending on the work of the conservancy, you can be surprised. And you, uh, the whole idea was very cinematic that you would walk uh, up the mall and have this beautiful LA of elm trees. And all of a sudden there's a staircase. It's like falling down a rabbit hole. And that's what I love about the park is that it's the variety that they wanted of kinds of experiences and sights and sounds and smells. It's all, you know, a surprise. It is such a beloved landscape and why all Olmsted or Olmsted and Vox landscapes are are equally beloved because they are, um, they bring you back to the essence of being human and being in nature. Um, if I had a goal in life left, um, it would be that um, urban parks, uh, particularly Olmsted parks, but urban parks need a place in the Smithsonian. Uh, you know, they're, they're a cultural and a historic important part of American history, and there is no real exhibit on the importance of America's urban parks, starting with Central Park. In, um, you know, when you go to the museum on the mall at the Smithsonian, nothing is dedicated to um, the work of um of uh, Olmsted and Vox and all the people who built um, urban parks, how important it is to American history. And, you know, if I had a dream, it would be to be able to go into the most important historic museum of American history on the mall in Washington and see um, the urban parks celebrated. but an honor to be part of the Olmsted Network, to be part of um, the, this magical, you know, transformation of America from parks that were dust bowls and scary and dangerous and covered in graffiti to places that people congregate now, celebrate, and people, um, you know, Olms the Central Park Conservancy and the Olm NAOP started the same year, 1980, I believe it was, um, for Olmsted NAOP. And, um, you know, it grew into a movement that makes people really appreciate how important parks are to daily life and the quality of life in, in urban spaces. Mm -hmm.